you could uh, bob back into your seats, we're going to start the second half of our first LH comedy gig. So if you could give a, a large hand of applause to your host, Helen Keane. Oh, brilliant. Hello. Did you have a good break? Yes. I'm so <laughs> very good. Uh, we have been collecting some of your answers to the big questions. So I'm going to share some of those with you now. Um, one or two of you have written your names, which makes it interesting. Um, so the question was, of course, if you could change the law of physics, what would it be and why? Uh, first one is quite, quite straightforward. One thing we can all agree with. Every action should have a massive overreaction. Why? It would make things exciting. Um, so someone's followed that with a, with a similar, similar vein. For every action, there is an equal and impossible to erase Facebook page. Um, <laughs> one of my favourites. And someone else has also... Uh, oh, actually, yeah, no, that's, I'm not sure about that one. Um, yeah, no, this... Yeah, um, you've been edited, that person. Um, but yeah, this one, this one isn't really um, a law of physics, but we kind of all really liked it. Um, they've written, I just want people... I just wish people would understand that a regular movie is 3D and a 3D movie is 4D. Eddie. <laughs> we hear you, Eddie. It's been bothering you for some time. Eddie is about there, yes. So, Luke, <laughs> so and also this one, I wish, I, could, I wish we had a camera. I wish we had a way of close-up, uh, going close-up on this one, because um, the answer's not really that interesting. They've written, uh, oh, I'd like to change the gravity laws. Uh, like this, everyone could fly and no one would have impotence problems. Um, <laughs> and then just in case we had any, you know, like, oh, what would that be like if no one had impotence problems? They've basically drawn porn. Um, <laughs> you've got a picture of people with everything flying everywhere. I don't know. I don't know, what, I don't know who drew... Th you haven't put your name on it. I'm not surprised. Um, good. Um, similar thing, gravity uh, would avoid my husband overdosing on Viagra. <laughs> Fine. Fine. Um, so uh, yes, good. Anyway, uh, so we will we will crack up back on in a minute because uh, time is is flying away. Time is flying away. Uh, so it's my huge pleasure now. Without further ado, we'll have some more of these later. Uh, to welcome back to the stage the wonder, he, like Brian Cox, only bad. I think we can say it's Sam Gregson, everybody. <laughs> oh! So that's a good start. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So my name is Sam, and I am a high-energy particle physicist at the University of Cambridge and here at the LHC, or as my flatmate prefers to call it, currently single. <laughs> <laughs> Not funny, is it? It's Not funny. <laughs> now, I'd like to throw something out there before we begin, which is a little thing I like to call the getting to know you game. So you should have had a little chance to get to know each other in the... Uh, in the interval there. But this night is all about outreach. It's all about the people from outside CERN coming and meeting us CERNY, seeing we're not that bad, and seeing a little bit about what we do here. Um, and this is a set about particle physics. So people tend to think that particle physics is going to have lots of hard words, there's going to be lots of maths. So I want to give those people from outside CERN a, a, a bit of cover. So if you're from outside CERN, you're not a CERN employee or a student, could you put your hand up, please? So good, good. And you put it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wasn't going to make you go into some sort of stress position. Um, and now if you are a CERN employee or student, could you now raise your hand, please? And keep it raised for a while. <laughs> okay, because what I want to do for the people who come from outside CERN, I want to give them this cover. And I want that if you hear any word or phrase in the set that you don't understand, you get to poke the nearest CERN person to you in the ribs. <laughs> Now, seriously, this is fine because we really do want to get to know you. And this is pretty much how most of my male friends at CERN flirt. <laughs> it's basically just an updated version of Facebook poking. <laughs> so, so I'm sure you've all heard a little bit about particle physics in the news recently. You know, the alleged faster than light neutrinos, the Higgs bows on the LHC, and hopefully you've seen the Big Bang Theory and, and Brian Cox on the telly. So hopefully you're wondering a little bit what it's all about. Well, I can, I can tell you. Particle physics is all about understanding what we call the quantum world. It's all about uh, setting up experiments to test how we think the universe uh, reacts on the, on the realm of the very small. Um, and if you think that's a little bit complicated, I have an analogy which I think will help. 
Particle physics is just like sex. And that's pretty handy because it tends to be the one thing that it replaces. <laughs> but, but seriously... <laughs> But seriously, particle physics includes all the best aspects of sex. Initially, you have no idea what you're doing or what you're looking for. So how do you start? Well, you start by randomly and crudely bashing things together, <laughs> desperately hoping for the explosion you're looking for, <laughs> which is exciting, but one way over or the other over far too quickly. The whole process involves a lot of trial and error, and the inevitable consequences of both are just a set of results that need to be cleaned up by a stack full of papers. <laughs> but if you're good at either, you do occasionally get the odd positive result. Then you've just got to worry about whether it's being faked. <laughs> now, for anyone who thought those jokes were a bit borderline, just be glad that I left out the jokes about black holes <laughs> and multiple body problems. <laughs> so all this experimentation, sexual and otherwise, goes on at here, right here at the LHC uh, in Geneva. But why in Brian Cox's name did we choose to put our huge experiment under half of Geneva? Well, there's actually many very good reasons. I mean, think about it. As your airport corridors so effectively tell us, with the LHC being expensive, if you want high-level financial advice, Geneva is the place for you. <laughs> the prices here are so reasonable. I should be uh, an advert for the tourist board. Um, <laughs> you're neutral in everything. So if we had created a black hole and destroyed the world, you probably wouldn't even fucking care. <laughs> and like whenever you work in Switzerland, the flag is just a massive plus. <laughs> we'll get, it'll, it'll ripple around, it'll ripple around. <laughs> so um, one, one thing I, I, I don't think people actually really understand the, the impact that the LHC has on Switzerland and has on, on Geneva specifically. The LHC is a 27 kilometer long ring which goes under most of Geneva. It really could be described as the Lord of the Rings. And I find that quite ironic because I found that my study of particle physics has been very much like being a character in the Lord of the Rings. First of all, I have to survive an insane amount of chat about how best to utilize the One Ring. A gray-haired old man is constantly telling me what to do and insisting I shall not pass. <laughs> and as Clara alluded to earlier, there are a dangerous lack of female characters to interact with. In fact, the only positive about this analogy is that nobody comments too harshly on my hairy feet. Now, like the Lord of the Rings, most people seem to think that the particle physics and the quantum mechanics that we do here at CERN is just magic. Now, we like to call these people biologists. <laughs> but seriously, there's actually no disgrace in not understanding the quantum world and quantum mechanics. The famous physicist Richard Feynman actually said, to paraphrase, that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Unfortunately, not an excuse that goes down very well with my supervisor. <laughs> but what is quantum mechanics, if not where Stephen Hawking goes to fix his wheelchair. What? Bad taste? T too much? Good? Happy? All right, good. This adult material was, uh, was advertised. Uh, so quantum mechanics is actually just the study of the very small, which is kind of ironic given the UK science budget. And it leads to a whole host of crazy phenomena, like objects being able to go through two holes at the same time, household pets being alive and dead at the same time, and an inability to know exactly where we are and where we're going. It really is uh, extremely strange. But I, I think the reason that people think quantum mechanics is so difficult is that the word quantum appears in front of things that are literally impossible to follow, like quantum field theory, quantum entanglement, or the plot of the James Bond film, Quantum of Solace. But seriously, it's not actually that bad. For example, if you want to understand how something can go through both holes at once, there are a large amount of instructional videos on the internet. <laughs> it's not that hard to be a quantum analyst. You just have to be very careful with your pronunciation of the word analyst. 
Okay, maybe this one was a bit far, but okay. Anal sex jokes are fun. <laughs> so, like I said, there's actually no disgrace in not understanding the quantum world. The way that us uh, physicists tend to deal with it, as you probably realize from the content of the set, is to deal in analogies. Um, who's heard of the famous uh, physicist Erwin Schrödinger? Who's heard of Schrödinger's cat? Okay, that, that gives a damning indictment of the state of the internet and how many cats are on it. But um, <laughs> So, uh, Schrodinger, uh, well, quantum mechanics tells us that we can't know the, the quantum state of a system until we make a measurement. Uh, a particle can be spin up and spin down. The, particle can, uh, the, the cat can be both alive and dead. But surely the cat can't be in a quantum superposition of these two states. It must just be alive or dead, right? Well, this is the sort of crazy implications that quantum mechanics has even for the experts. So like I say, there's no disgrace in any of you who don't understand quantum mechanics. Um, in passing, Schrodinger's cat, a fantastic thought experiment to describe a fundamental tenet of quantum mechanics. But as one ex unfortunate ex-girlfriend found, a terrible Christmas present. Not many people realize that the cat in the box can actually be in three states at the same time. Alive, dead, and fucking pissed off. <laughs> in fact, I think if Erwin Schrodinger had had access to lolcats and the rest of today's unnecessarily cat-laden internet, particle physics would be a very different place. So before I finish, I'd like to tell you a little, should probably tell you a little bit about what I actually do. So you might not know that there's four main experiments about the ring here at the LHC. There's ATLAS, ALICE, CMS, and LHCB, the Large Hadron Collider Beauty Experiment. And I work at the Large Hadron Collider Beauty Experiment, where I study charm physics. So I study charm and beauty at the LHC, which I can only assume was the establishment's own idea of a joke. <laughs> but seriously, I study the topic of CP violation, charge parity violation. Now, CP violation isn't something George Michael gets up to in an L.A. toilet. <laughs> it isn't something Kim Kardashian can do with her teeth. And it doesn't carry a mandatory four-year prison sentence. <laughs> CP violation actually studies the different physical characteristics of matter and antimatter. But some of you might not be aware of what antimatter is, so I'll give you a little bit of a primer. Everything around us is made of normal protons, neutrons, and electrons. But we now know that each of these particles has a, an antimatter partner, which has exactly the same properties, but an opposite electrical charge. But it's always good to have an analogy in hand when we talk about antimatter. And the best one that I could come up with is if I make myself matter and I make my ex-girlfriends antimatter. <laughs> because there's a lot of characteristics that are similar between my ex-girlfriends and antimatter. First of all, antimatter doesn't hang around very long. We don't see an awful lot of antimatter around. So little, in fact, that my mum's convinced it doesn't exist. <laughs> Thirdly, antimatter reacts violently when forced into contact with matter. <laughs> Works very well for any relationship I've ever been in. Fourthly, antimatter takes over a month to send your fucking shit back after you break up. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe we've taken the analogy a little bit far, but you see where I've been going. And you can see that we can actually understand the, the, the kind of esoteric and difficult aspects of something like antimatter by appealing to something that's actually very simple to understand. Women. Okay, maybe, maybe that doesn't work either. Okay, before I end up insulting half the audience, I should probably get off the stage. But I hope by talking to you about all this stuff, it sparks some interest in you about particle physics. And hopefully you can see that us particle physicists are not actually that bad. We're basically just a mixture of sex, Lord of the Rings, and Beyonce, which as far as I can tell, is any normal person's sexual fantasy. <laughs> and if anyone's interested, I will be backstage. Thank you very much. Just before I bring the next action, I've just got time to tell you a couple more of these. Uh, we've been sifting through them. We've picked our favourites. Um, favourite may be the wrong word for this. Well, if you could change a law of physics, what would it be and why? Women would be able to drive. No explanation needed. 
<laughs> yes. Um, I don't know who, who, does anyone want to admit to writing that? Yeah, was it? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> was there a reason, sir, that you moved to Switzerland, the country that didn't give women the vote till 1971, say? Uh, 1994, yeah, they wish it was 1994, but, um, really? Bloody hell. <laughs> Nice work, the Swiss. Um, anyway, oh no, and there's, a, there's, a, there's an addendum, which I should also read your addendum. Also, since the invention of sat-nav, why can my mum suddenly not find the shop, brackets, the same shop, that has been at the end of her street for 20 years without one? It's one of the big questions. I think that's your mum. Is that your mum laughing there? No. No? Okay. Oh, I made it weird now. Um, <laughs> oops. Um, so yes, this is uh, another one. I would like to have a teleporter, smiley face. Um, what law would it break? Question mark. Heisenberg uncertainty or something? Another question mark. I don't know. Probably more than one. <laughs> it's quite downbeat. Uh, but yeah, I think undoubtedly, I think my favourite, and this is signed, um, I wish, just calling back as well to uh, Sam said, I wish matter and antimatter didn't explode on contact because I want to have sex with my anti self. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whoa! And that was, and I hope I get your name right, Mattia Cinquelli? Mattia? Or was that a made-up name? Mattia? I think stand up, Mattia, and yeah, I think yes. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway, we were, we've still got a packed second half for you, so hello again if you're back, if you're watching at home as well. Um, yes, I am a time traveller from the future, sent here to stop CERN before it destroys the world. And um, I'm just putting this out there, just putting it out there, but no, <laughs> please, without further ado, welcome to the stage, your next act of the evening, Mr. Hugo Day, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um. All right, okay, so, evening, everybody. My name's Hugo, and I'm a physicist come engineer come Greased monkey, um, probably more towards the greasy ends than the physicist end. Um, and apparently, I'm supposed to explain to you how a particle accelerator works. This is going to be interesting because I've been working on them for three and a half years and I still don't know. Um, but let's try and get somewhere. So, to begin with, right, the big one you've probably all heard about the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. That's, that's got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? And like, physicists like, like names, acronyms. You know, the particle physicists have some lovely ones. You know, Atlas, Alice, CMET. Okay, maybe that one's not quite so interesting. <laughs> um, but you know, we actually have this whole menagerie of accelerators at CERN. You know, we start off with something called LINAC. So it just rolled off the tongue, nice and suave and smooth until you realize it's linear accelerator written for short. We're nice and original here. But then after that, we get into the PSB, proton synchrotron booster. Now, that's it. now we're getting somewhere, booster. Uh, this one goes out to the PS, the proton synchrotron. Okay, so this is the oldest one, so we can give them some credit for this one. They weren't thinking about puns at that one. Until we go to the SPS. Super! Oh, see, now we're getting somewhere, now we're getting somewhere. Proton! Ah, uh, synchrotron. Right, okay, so we're not that good at making good names, but thankfully we traded all of our credence in for good puns for trying to figure out how to do weird shit with particles. So, a little bit about the LHC, right? Biggest machine, highest energy accelerator in the world. Accelerates particles to seven tera electron volts. And any of you probably, if I ask you what that is, probably have the same response my mum did, which is to give me that nice blank look, a condescending pat on the head and say, that's nice, dear. What do you want for dinner this evening? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, let's, let, let's give you an idea of what this actually is. So, seven tera electron volts is roughly about the same energy as that pesky mosquito that keeps you awake at night and you spend all time trying to swat. Except we don't just have one of those, right? We have a hundred trillion of them in our accelerator. That's like a one with 14 zeros after it. <sighs> right, well, about that many. But, uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never really seen a hundred trillion mosquitoes at one point. 
don't particularly want to see 100 trillion mosquitoes at any point. Even if half of them are hungry, that's, yeah, no. Um, so we can come up with something better than this, right? This is like maybe like 100 billion bees. Oh, wait, no, that's, that's, that's not much better. Um, 100 million static shocks. No, 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 that's, that's, that's not much better. 100,000 bullets. Oh, uh, no, that's, that's not much better. 100 cars. Uh, yeah, it's still not much better. Okay, so it's about like a train going on a railway filled with bees, angry bees, <laughs> moving at the speed of light. And we want to move... Right, okay, okay. And we have to make them go round in a circle. Ha. Huh. I don't know about you, I don't really like like touching trains that are moving fast. Particularly not fast moving trains that are filled with bees. A lot of bees. Um and if we do touch it, it will uh make a very big expensive pay for weight. Ha, huh. that's that's not ah but thankfully we can find a way around this, right? As those of you who are going round to the loo, um, you might have seen this big, long blue thing outside. It's 14 meters, and it's a superconducting dipole. And this is what we use to actually control our beams in the machine. We can't touch them. If we do that, we're going to have a big paperweight. Um, but we can control them with magnetic fields. Um, these things are wonderful. They're big, 15 meters long, nice and cold, about 2 Kelvin. Well, okay, minus 271 degrees centigrade, about minus 450 Fahrenheit if you're using old money, um, or a particularly warm summer's day in Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> and we're running through this massive quantity of current. But doing this, we can drive our angry bee-filled train around in a circle. Um, except that at some point, somebody has decided that we're not just allowed one bee fill train, we have to have two. And then they're going to go around in opposite directions, and then they want us to collide them together. Thanks, Sam. Um, and then we have to stop them. But thankfully, at this point, we hand it off to the particle physicist, so we don't have to care. Um, but this means we have a lot of like, energy and power in this machine, um, which brings us to a slight problem, because at some point, you know, we can't keep it there forever and eventually we have to get rid of it. And I don't know about you, but when the angry bee field train stops, I don't particularly want to be there when they open the doors. <laughs> 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 Surprise ending. There, a bit of a surprise ending. Hugo, everybody. Fantastic. Uh, wearing, I have to say, a very excellent t shirt. Do we appreciate Hugo's geeky t shirt? No. Okay. <laughs> I, no, I mentioned it because I have been wandering around CERN today and I have seen a plethora of the most geeky t shirts anywhere, ever. So I kind of I put my own. It is kind of a, an approximation of a geeky t shirt because I'm going to Wolves. You probably get they can't, can't have too many items of clothing with wolves on them, but I think I've just got the balance uh, just about right, because of course you have wolves very near here in Switzerland. Yeah, they're my favourite animal. I'm very, has anyone seen a wolf, encountered a wolf? No? Okay. <laughs> but they're very, that's they're very safe animals, they have a very bad reputation. I know this because I have done some research into this, because there's always, uh, I go on holiday to Scotland quite a lot, because my career's going really well. Um, and uh, in Scotland, there's always a big controversy about reintroducing wolves into the wild. I wish they would. As I say, I love them as animals. They're my favourite animals. Uh, people think it's dangerous. It's not. Right? If you've been to America, you'll know wolves all over the shop, everywhere you go. Uh, in the last hundred years, only three Americans have been eaten by wolves. Mm, fact fans. I said that to a friend of mine, actually, who said rather cryptically in reply, that's not enough. Um, <laughs> I don't really know where he was going with that. Apologies to any Americans. But no, you, you don't need to worry. If you, are, if you are a bit nervous about wolves, Switzerland, I'm sensing a certain amount of uh, equivocation here. Don't worry, right? Because if you are walking in the mountains one day and you do encounter a wolf, uh, very unlikely that it will attack you. But if it's going to attack, right, it will give you very clear warning signals first, right? Because what they do, wolves, before they pounce, is they raise their hackles on the back of their neck, right? And they bar their teeth like this, yeah? and then they dress up as an old lady and hide in your bed. 
while they're getting the bonnet on, that is the window of escape. <laughs> yeah. Watch and learn, sir, and watch and learn. Anyway, uh, without any more public service announcements about wolves, uh, I am going to introduce our next act. Are you ready for our next act? Yeah! yeah. Please give her a huge welcome to the stage. It's the fantastic Claire Lee, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Woo. You guys having a good time? Yeah. Oh, good. That, that's great. Have you learned anything cool? Okay, <laughs> nothing, nobody learned anything tonight? Really, really, come on, people, come on, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> wow, all right, so my name's Claire, um, and I work on the Atlas Experiment too, just like Clara. Um, yeah, that, that's actually quite, quite funny. There's, uh, so, so you guys can go home and say, two out of two of the female CERN physicists here tonight work on the Atlas Experiment, and their names begin with Claire. So, 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 yeah, I work on Atlas, um, which is that one uh, back there. Um, it, it's not a butthole, Alex. Um, it, it's a great experiment. It's a fantastic experiment. In fact, it's the biggest of all the LHC experiments. It's so big, in fact, that it's half the size of the Notre Dame Cathedral, which, you know, is a perfectly reasonable unit of measurement to use in everyday life. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys should come and see my new apartment. Um, it's, it's got uh, ensuite bathrooms and a wonderful view of Mont Blanc and the jet. Um, and it's about 0.1 Notre Dame's of wonderful airy space inside. <laughs> or, you know, like cooking in the kitchen. Um, you know, so you want to add your butter, sugar, two eggs, uh, one millionth of a Notre Dame of flour, and mix gently. <laughs> um, what else about Atlas? Oh, uh, another thing that they like to quote is that Atlas weighs about the same as 100 Boeing 747 jets. And then in brackets, they put the word empty. <laughs> now, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't exactly go bench pressing um, Boeing 747s in, in my free time, um, <laughs> mainly because I don't really have free time being, being a student on, on Atlas. Um, but even if I did, and I, I wouldn't actually even know where to begin a comparison of how much that actually weighs. I mean, presumably it's a lot, um, but I, I don't even, I, I don't know, 100 Boeing, Boeing 747s? I don't even know how much 100 of my own child weighs, and I pick him up every day. So, so maybe as much as 100 Notre Dames? Who knows? So, okay, wh what do I do? I'm a particle physicist. I physics, I, I do, I do, uh, I physics! I physics! <laughs> oh, what do you do? I physics. That's like science. I science. I, I science for a living. That, that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I am a particle physicist. I do physics. I have a degree in physics, which means that I, I spend a lot of my time um, generally just being an idiot. Um, it's true. Actually, one of the things I do quite a lot is I do a lot of coding. Uh, we have to write code uh, to analyze the data that comes out of the LHC. Um, and I spent a good deal of time earlier this week st accidentally staring at my own code and thinking, what the hell does this person think they're doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I also attend meetings. We, we've got a lot of meetings. So we've got meetings on performance studies, on analysis, um, shift type of meetings. In fact, uh, we have so many meetings that at one point, Atlas formed a meeting optimization committee <laughs> whose job, I kid you not, was to have meetings to discuss how to reduce the number of meetings. <laughs> that clearly worked. No, um, <laughs> what else do we do? Oh, okay, um, one of the things that you have to do when you work on an experiment here is you have to do some type of service work. So you have to do stuff that's not really like fun stuff, like looking for Higgses and, and, and that sort of thing, or uh, imaginary stuff like supersymmetry. Don't, don't tell me I said that. Um, uh, one of the things you have to do, so what I did was I worked on part of the calorimeter, uh, and I ended up doing shifts, a couple of shifts, on, in, in the Atlas control room. Um, and I remember one of my first shifts uh, I was sitting in the Atlas control room uh, with a friend of mine who, who coincidentally was also called Claire. That's three of us, right? Three, three Atlas physicists, uh, right? Oh, people who are pregnant, 
just be warned that if you have a girl and you name her Claire, she's got a really good chance of coming and working on Atlas. <laughs> it's a great experiment. We've got like a click going. She's going to be popular. <laughs> so um, I remember we had this one shift, and somebody had gone outside for a cigarette and had put their cigarette out in, in that, that boxy thing that you're supposed to put cigarettes out in, but it hadn't gone out. So there was like this trail of smoke coming up. And we've got this person who's in charge of safety around the whole experiment, um, and we saw this smoke, uh, and their job was actually to call the certain fire department. So Claire was the only person, being French, was the only person ha that happened to be in the Atlas control room at the time who could speak French. Um, so she ended up having to be the one to phone the CERN fire department to come, and, uh, to come to point one. And here they arrive, like they march, march in, all completely decked out in their fire equipment, helmets, suits, everything. And they're like standing around discussing the fire ha safety hazard of a cigarette that is inside a cigarette put her out a thing <laughs> that is not out. And you can sort of like literally see these guys like looking at each other and thinking, you know, what, 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 what the physicist um, and you know you, I, I, I don't know I, I don't know what, really know what happened but presumably one turned to the other and said something like oui Jean-Pierre nous besoin uh, de Notre Dame de l'eau maintenant <laughs> okay my French is terrible I'm from South Africa so you know we have 11 official languages French is not one of them bear with me um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, um, so Claire and I actually ended up being like known at forever as the two Claires from Liquid Argonne uh, who, who called the CERN fire department about a cigarette. <laughs> <sighs> so this type of job, it, it takes up a lot of time and, and maybe a lot of your mental health capacity as well. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that you really need to try and be able to do is, is strike up a bit of a work-life balance. Um, and amazingly enough, I, I am married and I have a, a great husband who um, actually is not here tonight because he couldn't find the correct type of tomatoes from the Carrefour. <laughs> um, love you, babes. <laughs> Hopefully you're watching on, on the web and not throwing tomatoes at your computer. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I don't remember what I was going to say now. Oh, oh yes. So, so you know, everybody has needs, uh, and you have to really sort of balance these needs out in a particular relationship. Like, for example, my supervisor needs me to make a whole bunch of plots at a really alarming rate, and I have to really try and keep up, which is difficult. Um, but I came up with this great idea. So I thought, what if, what if, right? What if we all had lovers? And then I could tell my lover that I was spending time with my husband, I could tell my husband that I was spending time with my lover, and I could come to CERN and get some actual work done. <laughs> you guys are laughing, but I see some of the CERN people in the audience are like, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> I'm taken. Uh, Sam, Sam is free for, for the ladies in the house. <laughs> that's what he said. I know he's got hairy feet, though. <laughs> Shave your feet, Sam. Um, okay, so, so yeah, I don't know, it, it, it probably wouldn't, wouldn't work, because I, I generally sort of end up walking around um, looking a bit, like, a bit like a mess. Safety shoes on, um, this is not really like how I normally, normally walk around, these, these are my safety boots. Uh, we were actually down in the underground uh, today at the Atlas Detector, I took uh, the professionals down because I'm an Atlas guide, I do that sort of thing for fun. Um, although, and I thought it went pretty well, but apparently uh, Pierre didn't, didn't learn much, much at all, apart from and and but and a couple of other general words that anybody could find in an English dictionary. Um, but, you know, you know, so my hair's a little bit of a mess, and it's because I have to wear my safety helmet. So we, ha we take safety pretty, pretty seriously. And, you know, you have to. Uh, it's, it's, it's a big experiment. There are a lot of people working on it all the time. And you, know, you have to make sure you're wearing your, your safety boots and your helmet just in case our, our gigantic 7,000-ton detector <laughs> that is half the size of the Notre Dame Cathedral comes crashing down on your head. As long as you've got your helmet on, then you're okay. <laughs> Got your helmet? Pas problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, so when we go downstairs, there's a lot of uh, security that you have to uh, do as well. Um, 
walking walking through there's there's these specific doors that we have to go through. Uh, so so one of so you go through the door, you have to scan your decimeter, make sure it knows it's you. You have to stand this little yellow box, and it weighs you. Um, thankfully, it doesn't give you the readout. Um, <laughs> it, it weighs you. It's, it's got like laser beams and stuff to check that there's nobody else in there with you, and nobody's like hanging on my back. Um, and then I have to do you have to do like a retinal scan as well. Uh, and then only if you pass all of those tests do you actually allow to go in and, and down underground. So um, when they were testing out this, the system, they put these in the corridors at CERN, and they got people to just walk through um, forwards and backwards and try to break, break it and try, just, you know, try, to, try to get through and, and get as many people through as possible. And they learned a lot of stuff and, and you know, were able to fix up the security quite, quite a lot. Um, but they also learned a very interesting difference between guys and girls. So it turned out that, because they had, they had cameras trained on these things, right? So it turned out that when guys walked through, uh, for the retinal scan thing, it, it's, it's like this thing that you have to look at, um, and it's, a bit, it's adjustable. But, you know, guys don't really bother with that. So, so wherever it was pointing, they would sort of, you know, like, uh, put themselves like this and, and hold still for a little bit, and, and then pick, and, you know, then they would walk through. Whereas girls, on the other hand, uh, well, women, um, you know, we're much more used to looking at ourselves in a mirror and standing up straight and posing and that sort of thing. So what ended up happening was women would walk through um, and they would stand up straight and, and turn and, and adjust the uh, retinal scanner so it hit themselves perfectly in the face. You know, I mean, we're, we're used to doing this, you know, take selfies, right? <laughs> um, get that right, you, you walk through. Um, so actually, the first time I heard about this was when a, a friend of mine uh, took me on a tour of CMS and he told the story to me. And I was a little bit horrified because it turned out that I had been doing it the, the wrong way <laughs> the entire time. <laughs> so now I make a point of walking there and standing in my little box and, and, and doing it the girl way because, you know, I, I try really, really hard to be a little bit more of a girly girl, you know, in, in my safety shoes and, and hard hat. Um, yeah, okay, okay, so <laughs> enough of that. Um, okay, um, what about, are there any summer students uh, in, in the globe tonight? <laughs> Whoa, awesome, they're all hiding at the back. What are you guys doing at the back? Jeez. Okay, um, so, so uh, for those of you uh, who are not, not CERN people, summer students are students who, who come to CERN and, and spend some of their summer at CERN. I probably didn't need to explain that, did I? <laughs> Okay, um, so, 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 right, summer students, we've got, we got young people here like wanting to do physics. Um, I thought I would share with you a piece of information that I was given, a piece of advice that I was given when I first started out in physics. And I remember one of my professors uh, was saying to us in the lecture, make sure that you are actually serious about learning the subject. But I actually misheard because I wasn't really paying too much attention, and I thought he, and I, I left out the word serious, so I thought he said something like, Make sure you are actually learning the subject, which, to be honest, is actually a little bit more appropriate considering you know, we were sitting in our first quantum mechanics lecture at the time. And, and for my perspective of, of this whole thing, it was going something like, like Gary, Psst, Gary, are we in the right place? the right room that it said on the lecture notes. <laughs> There's math on the board. Yeah, I know, but this is like weird maths. This is like a different language of math. Not even maths does this kind of maths. This is like king on maths. <laughs> maths. No, nobody's ever serious uh, about doing that, that kind of maths, unless you're a mathematician. There, there was a mathematician here earlier. Who's, who's, you're, you're a mathematician. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so yeah. Uh, Okay, you know, maybe, maybe mathematicians are serious about doing things, but not normal people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, so, so actually it was fantastic because one of the guys in our class um, was going out with a girl who was doing uh, a major in maths. Um, and she was like our pet mathematician. It was fantastic. We would feed her chocolate and she would do all our horrible integration for us. <laughs> okay, so some of the students, new advice. Get yourself a pet mathematician. You're going to have to watch out because, uh, you know, you're going to get mobbed by 50 uh, summer students wanting a pet later. Okay, just buy chocolate. She says it's cool if you just, just get some chocolate. <laughs> We're in Switzerland. I mean, it's not like there's a shortage, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> right. Um, okay. So, so what else? Um, okay. So, so okay. Maybe a bit more more realistic advice. As as physicists, we need to um, be able to observe the world around us and and take note of what's happening and, and see see things. Um, so, as as Hugo mentioned, there there are these like gigantic blue dipoles, sort of randomly situated in places around CERN. For example, outside the restaurant, uh, the CERN cafeteria, the restaurant. You know, because where, where what else do you do when you're decorating a restaurant than put a gigantic <laughs> blue dipole on the front lawn? You know, it's, so it's like the new the new decor, right? Um, so when we first moved here, which was two years ago, my son uh, was, was actually about one years old, and we were sitting at, at the restaurant, and um, I said to him, oh, look, man, uh, it's a dipole. And he like, looks at it, and he says, dipole. And here we are, <laughs> all have chuffed and patting ourselves on the back. You know, my my one-year-old can say dipole. What can yours do? <laughs> this is like some of the non-certain people are like, oh, my God, that poor child. Um, <laughs> But um, you know, then a couple of a couple of months later, we were back there again, sitting on the lawn, um, and you know, my kid was sitting there as well, eating his chips. Um, and he, he looks and he says, "Mummy, where's the dipole?" So it turned out that this dipole had had been just taken away for for repainting or whatever about two weeks ago, and we had been sitting there for two weeks and we hadn't even noticed. And it took a three-year-old <laughs> to point this out to me. It's like the other day, um, I, I was, you know, I, I could learn quite a lot from my, my three-year-old. He actually teaches me a lot more than, than I realize, I think. He, he trains me probably also a lot more than I realize, come to think of that. Um, but yeah, so the other day, I was, I, I'd lost my sewing card. And you need your sewing card to just get into the gates and, and some, some areas and, and backwards and forwards. Um, and I, I'd lost my sewing card. I don't know where it was, somewhere in the house. Uh, and it was only when I realized I was standing in front of my fridge, which is, you know, uh, one ten thousandth of a Notre Dame big, <laughs> um, and I was busy thinking about whether my card could have been hiding behind the chocolate milk. Then I decided, okay, time to put the physics away and go play outside. Thank you very much, guys. You've been a great audience. Hope you're having fun. And poor old Sam coming in for a bit more teasing there as well, poor Sam. Uh, we were actually suggesting backstage that, that we um, auction Sam uh, <laughs> for a date to the highest bidder. I don't know if anyone wants, anyone particularly like what they've seen and want to start bidding off? Right here. Oh, excellent. How much? How much, lady there? How much? She's having a discussion. She's regretting it. This is buyer's regret setting in already. No. One franc fifty, <laughs> Sam. Don't get too big-headed. Any advance on one franc fifty? Two. <laughs> and they said there was a lot of money floating around in Geneva. Uh, we may come back to this. Some of you can sort of consider maybe have a look at him in the catalogue. Uh, but yes, um, I'm going to move the stool now. Actually, for our next uh, act, I'm just going to do a bit of stagecraft here seamlessly. Uh, this is for our next act. Hi, stool. He is very small. Um, no, it's not. Um, no, yes, it's, uh, it's very exciting for me to introduce our next act uh, because he has come all the way from Belgium. Yeah. yeah! As have those people, I am guessing, as have those people. And where he is a huge star, am I right? He's a huge star in Belgium and probably lots of other countries as well, which is very exciting. Uh, so, yes, without further ado, please. Oh, you've got a sign. What does that say? Oh, you've got a sign with his name on. It's like you're in an airport or something. Were you, were you meant to meet him at the airport and you just thought, I bring it along now? He went, my. Fantastic! Wow, he has got a lot of fans in tonight. Um, <laughs> I've never seen someone hold a sign up at a comedy gig before with just the act's name on it. That is <laughs> kind of something. <laughs> yes. Without no further ado, please give him a huge sun welcome. We are very lucky to have him here tonight. It is, and I've been practicing this all day. Leven Schkerhart. Yes. <laughs> everyone is this on excellent there I know you're tired but I'm not <laughs> I'm at CERN god damn it I kind of went berserk in the gift shop as you can see <laughs> yes I bought everything there's nothing left there 
Yes. And I have Swiss francs now. <laughs> it's really exciting because now I can pay fines in the Tour de France. <laughs> Might come in handy someday, yes. Yes, as you notice, I'm very excited to be at CERN. I love CERN. It's, uh, it's the most famous experiment of the European Union, apart from Greece, of course. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> yes, well, yes. But, <coughs> I love this place. I love it, because I'm a physicist. Yes. Yeah, as you noticed, I have a small note here with my set written out. I don't usually do this, but it was very hard to try out this set, you know. I called my agent and said, I need five tryouts in subatomical investigation environments. <laughs> and he couldn't do it. I fired him, of course, yes. <laughs> but I'm a physicist. Where are the physicists? Physicists are <laughs> sons and daughters of the light, as my professor used to call us, yes. Any, any chemists? Chemists here? Chemists? Oh, yeah. Yes, well, yes. <laughs> Welcome to the chemists and, well, congratulations for trying. You know, this, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're almost physicists, you know, they are. Where are the mathematicians? Ah, <laughs> the higher elves of science. Yes, they are so logical, they are so exact. I, I heard a very nice joke about mathematicians the other day. It, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna tell, tell the mathematician. Well, there's two mathematicians jokes, you know. I heard them from, from a friend. One is, uh, I, I, called, I called the department of mathematicians of my university the other day, and there was a voice saying, we are really sorry, the number you have dialed is imaginary. <laughs> yes. And then it said, please, please tilt your telephone 90 degrees and try again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so... I was gonna tell a mathematician's joke. So, there's a sociologist, right? A sociologist and a physicist and a mathematician and they're traveling to Scotland. Now, as you all know, in, um, in physics, we look for an order of magnitude and we can abbreviate and, you know, do the back of the envelope thing. In maths, they don't. They are very, 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 very exact. Now, a physicist, a sociologist and a mathematician are traveling to Scotland and they're landing there in, in Scotland. They're, they're taking their first walk in Scotland and they see two black sheep standing there in a meadow. Can I say meadow? What do you usually say? Or is meadow a medieval word? No? In, in the prairie. <laughs> on, the, on the grass field. I'll stick with meadow. So, they walk, they see two black sheep in a meadow. And the sociologist looks at them and says, well, I've just arrived in Scotland. I've only seen two sheep here and they were both black. So I can conclude that all the sheep in Scotland are black. Because that's how sociology works. <laughs> now, it's a good thing that there's a physicist standing next to him and he says, well, I think we should look for maybe a safer conclusion. I think it's safer to conclude there are black sheep in Scotland. That's just safe, you know, we're not making any mistakes. And then the mathematician is looking at him with, well, what we call the math look, like, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, not agreeing. That's, uh, that's yeah, the disagreeable math look. Like, like. So he looks in his agenda, he looks at his watch, and then he looks in the distance and he says, at February 2nd, 1999, at quarter past two, there were in this meadow in Scotland two sheep who were black at at least one side. <laughs> they like to be exact, <laughs> is what I say, yes. I told this joke at, at, uh, at uh, my university, and after the show, a mathematician came up to me and said, Oh, Mr. Schere, do you think a mathematician would come to a conclusion based on visual information? <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 This really happened, yeah. He had a, a disagreeing math look in his eyes, uh, by the way, yes. I, I had some exams in the maths department and I was walking next to a professor. This really happened too. I was walking next to a professor after an, 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 or, an oral exam and we passed by the toilets. And I said, Professor, toilets in the math department, isn't this just too earthly for you? <laughs> yes, I really did. Uh, but I was lucky. It was a, 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 a professor with a sense of humor. And he looked at me and said, Mr. Scherer, these toilets are for the students. We like to abstract these things. <laughs> and, yeah, and then he walked on, yeah. I didn't pass the exam anyway, so yeah, 
it's a bad luck. But anyway, we had physicists, we had chemists, we had math people. Any engineers here? Engineers. Oh, lots of, lots of engineers. I'll speak slower, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, yes. Yeah. For, for those of you who are really surprised now, it's, you know, it's logic. There's, there's a playful rivalry between physicists and engineers. It's not aggressive. It's playful. We like each other, but it's a playful rivalry. It has a history, you know. We don't always, well, we're sometimes annoyed by engineers because they sell out the beauty of science for money to industry, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and of course, the engineers are sometimes annoyed by physicists because we do have beautiful women graduating. Now, um, every time I tell this joke, after the show, a very beautiful female engineer comes up to me and goes like, the thing is, that's circumstantial evidence, you know. And, I, 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 you know, I can't draw n new conclusions based on circumstantial evidence. So I will, I will only be convinced when a statistical, well, a, a, a huge statistical amount of very beautiful female engineers is driven to my home in the <laughs> Neckersfeverstraat 132 in Ghent in Belgium, yes. Until then, yes. But, you know, it's just, do, do you know the difference between a civil engineer and a technical engineer? We have this difference in Belgium. It's very simple. A technical engineer, this is the guys who, who learn to weld and things like that. And it's very simple. A technical engineer will build a bridge. It will stay upright, but he will not understand why. <laughs> While a civil engineer will build a bridge, it will collapse, and he will understand perfectly why. <laughs> that's, that's the difference. But, you know, we're not aggressive. You know, we, we, the, the rivalry is because we share the same playground. We're both men of science. We're not into the social sciences. <laughs> right? Contradictio in terminis. But we're, you know, we share the same playground. The difference is we like to play football on the playground and the engineers like, like to look for clever ways to make money out of people watching us play football. But <laughs> it's, we agree. But a lot of physicists, I remember a lot of physicists, who are the experimental physicists? Great. Who are the theoretical physicists? Yes. Well, two. I'm even amazed they showed up, you know. <laughs> I have to sit on a chair. I will not sit on a chair. It is a physical object. <laughs> I can predict a chair for you if you want. I will not sit on it, yes. <laughs> you will have to ask an engineer to sit on a chair. Yes. You know, now you have all the experimental physicists laughing, but in the end of the day, they know the theoretical ones are a bit smarter than they are. <laughs> now, um, a good, anyway, so I am a physicist, I told you, and also I am from Belgium. Ah, uh, yes, I brought my own fan club, yes, as a colleague puts it, I'm famous in half of one of the smallest countries in the world, yes, makes you feel good, yes, I'm from Belgium, things you have to know about Belgium, we were the recent winners of the Gérard Depardieu tax avoidance competition, yes, in a close tie with Russia, yes. And this is, a, this is a dangerous place to say this, because, of course, the Swiss are very annoyed, you know. People have to come to us to avoid the taxes, <laughs> not to the stupid Belgium, yes. First we make better chocolate than they do, now this, they're very annoyed, you know. They're very, very, very annoyed, yes. But yeah, they have to come to us because we are neutral in kind of an opportunistic way, <laughs> yes. Switzerland is neutral, they're so neutral. Actually, they're so neutral that I'm surprised that they allow a proton beam to enter the country. <laughs> yes, which they do, yes. Also, we have a Belgian vice president in CERN, Walter van Donink. It was in the news in Belgium. What? A Belgian in a leading position? <laughs> Front page, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, we shouldn't be so surprised. There's many Belgians in big positions in Europe. You might have noticed, you know, there, there's the European president. Well, he does fuck all, but anyway. Is it <laughs> Herman van Rompuy, European president. The head of the International Olympic Committee is Jacques Roger. He's Belgian. The first European astronaut to ever be the commander of the International Space Station was a Belgian guy, Frank de Winne. So we have lots of Belgians in high positions. Now, if we would be French or Dutch, we would say, yes, that's because we are the best country in the world. But we know better. <laughs> we know this is only the case because we are harmless. Yes. <laughs> yes. When the French and the British and the Germans are fighting over position, we are harmless. 
Yes. We are the hobbits of Europe. <laughs> yes, it's true. Yeah. You've got the elves and the dwarves. I'm not letting an elf carry the ring. I'm not letting a dwarf carry the ring. Oh, there's a hobbit. Leave it with him. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Take this ring to Mount Doom and bring some chocolate on the way back because we're, uh, we're getting sick of this Swiss shit. No, I'm sorry. I do. No, no, no. I do apologize. I didn't mean that. Yeah. Other things you need to know about Belgium. We have a homosexual Italian prime minister. Thank you very much, yes. We just did it to piss off the Americans, yes. Yeah. Black president, eh? Well. We have a homosexual Italian. Thank you very much. Homosexual immigrant beats formerly enslaved ethnicity. According to the Geneva Convention. Yes, yeah. Yes, so many things going on in Geneva, you know, Geneva Convention, everything, everything, you know. What, what, what's, what's here? Is the Red Cross in Geneva? Yes. Anybody here works for the Red Cross? No. <laughs> okay. Killing, you know, just, just uh, curing injured people. The, the, the Médecins Sans Frontières, is it also here? Yes. Well, anybody for the Médecins Sans Frontières? No, no. <laughs> it's too close to the border, they don't come, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah. The, the World Health Organization? Oh, over there, excellent, yes. I was told by some physicists working here that the majority of people working at CERN is male and the majority of people at the World Health Organization is female. Yes, and they actually have parties joining together. <laughs> yes, it's true, it's true. Then of course, you know, having a one-night stand with somebody from the World Health Organization will give you the safest sex ever, you know, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Excusez-moi, is it possible to wear, to wear five condoms at a time, please? <laughs> yeah. The professional habits of mine, yes. Parfois, je peux continuer en français? Non? Ça va? Oui? Oui, oui, bien sûr. Parce que la langue officielle de CERN, c'est anglais et français, non? Yeah, fucking right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 no offense. It's just that, you know, sometimes you're like, yes, but, yeah, le français, c'est aussi, il y a l'anglais, mais le français, c'est aussi la langue internationale. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I say, what the fuck? Or, <laughs> as you put it, qu'est-ce que la nique? Yes. <laughs> qu'est-ce que la nique? Yes. So, what's next? Oh, yes, the building. I love this building. It's wooden and it's circular. And I think this is the ideal building to have an illegal drugs party. <laughs> yes, yes, hear me out, hear me out, it makes sense. Whenever the Swiss cops arrive, we could just roll over to France, you know. <laughs> yeah. You could just start, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, you can, you can hear them arriving, yell, oh, everybody to the left, whoa, roll over to France, yes. Qu'est-ce que tu vas faire maintenant? <laughs> Espèce de brigadier de mes couilles. Ah, je suis en France. Ah, rien ne peut passer ici. Ah. Then the French cops arrive too. Whoa, fuck. Head for the tunnel, everyone. Yo. <laughs> Walking around the tunnel, yes. I think this would be the ideal house for Julian Assange, right? <laughs> Just rolling back and forth from one country to another. Yeah. Can't touch me. Yes. Yes. But I know why they built CERN in Switzerland. It, it's, it's logical. I mean, it's a tunnel. Come on. You had this meeting at the European Union. Oh, yes, so it's a scientific experiment and we have to knee. Well, we should build a giant tunnel. Then the Swiss guys go, did you say tunnel? <laughs> we are very fond of tunnel. <laughs> we built tunnel for you. Mm. <laughs> and they did. They built a tunnel. In fact, when the tunnel was finished, they weren't satisfied. So they built another one a bit down the road just for recreational purposes, you know. <laughs> it's just anyway, well, we build another tunnel here. <laughs> Why? Why? It's a village. It's a tunnel underneath the village. <laughs> Why do you need a tunnel underneath a village? It's a tunnel. <laughs> ah. We like the tunnel. <laughs> yes. They really like tunnels, though. Yes, they do, yeah. 
I had a small problem before, you know, you've noticed I'm pretty excited as a physicist to be working at CERN. I actually, I, I quit my physics education in the last year to become a comedian and, and, and a TV host. And now I'm, I'm working at CERN. Well, I'm, I'm being paid in beer, but anyway. <laughs> I work at CERN for one night. I can work at CERN. You know, it's, it's, it's just amazing to, to be here. Now, th the problem I had was when I came here, I, I wanted to, I, I couldn't choose what nerdy t-shirt to wear. <laughs> yeah, I have so many nerdy t-shirts that nobody understands except the people here. And I could just wear one. So I felt like a woman for the first time in my life. <laughs> you know, just standing there, oh my God. Oh. I, I want a sexy nerd joke, but it can't be a slutty nerd joke, you know. <laughs> What to wear? So many things to wear. There's not many moments in your life when you can't decide between pixelated tie and a t-shirt with Schrodinger's cat and saying, quantum mechanics possibly tested on animals. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was hard. So I decided to wear all my t-shirts at once, <laughs> which is what's happening now, and we'll just strip them off one by one. You know, so I will start, yes. Well, I have to say, I will stop at the last t-shirt, you know. I have been developing a small beer belly lately, and as a physicist, it's okay to be fat. You can be fat as a physicist, because when you're a fat physicist and you're lying in your couch, and somebody walks by and says, what are you lying there, you fat, lazy physicist? You're like, ah, you call me lazy. I have a rest energy of five billion joules. <laughs> so you just sod off. But I will stop at the, at, at the last t-shirt. So, okay, now, uh, uh, he, here comes the first one. Just, just, just a second. There. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> this one says, keep calm and use the bloody metric system. Now, dear Anglo-Saxon friends, <laughs> you know, we like to measure things, and we have developed a system in continental Europe. It's called the metric system. And we use it because it's 2013, and we don't live in medieval times anymore. <laughs> we don't need to measure lengths of things with our thumbs and our feet. Yes? <laughs> we don't need to. No. We... Yes. We took our time to develop a better system, yes. And because, you know, we have, it's very logical. It's, it's 1,000 millimeters in a meter, and 1,000 meters in a kilometer, and so on, and so on. It's easy. It's not like 12 thumbs in a foot, <laughs> and three feet in a yard, and then 22 yards in a chain, yes. And they even, they even weigh in stones, yes. Ah. Borg be too fat. Borg be weighing more than stone. Mm. Borg need to lose a few stone. Yes. Now, when I heard about this stone, I was happy that they actually used chains because that's a more modern system. It means they invented iron already. So, chain. But there's no need for this anymore. We have the metric system now. It's logical and it's easy and it's not like three feet in a yard and 22 yards in a, in a kangaroo's jump or whatever you, whatever you make up in Oompa Loompa land. We have the metric system. And look, I might sound aggressive and people say sometimes, you are forcing this upon us. I'm not. We are not forcing this upon us. It's more of a trade, all right? We use your language. You use our metric system. Okay? Yes. No. Yeah. It's an agreement, yes. And I would like to put this agreement in a contract, okay? So when I walk out of this place and I hear one more inch of foot, yes? We will put the entire internet in French, okay? <laughs> yes, we will, yes. And for those French-speaking people here who think now, mais l'internet c'est déjà en français, no? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It's not. That's just the part we let you dick around on, okay? <laughs> there is more. Yes, there is more. Good. That said, on to the next t-shirt. Ah. 
there, yes. This one is for the physicists, of course. Yes, thank you. Very few physicists in this room, yes. I might warn you, dear physicists, don't ask me how I feel or I might collapse. Yes, thank you, yes. This was, a, this was the nerdiest joke of the evening. So all the physicists, I would ask you to explain the joke to the colleague next to you, probably working at accountancy or something like that. Yes, have you, have you, can you imagine how hard it must be to work in accountancy or finance in CERN, you know? Gary, you better watch out with these guys. They actually understand numbers. <laughs> uh, yeah. They even invented a few numbers of their own. Yeah. <laughs> yes. One of these freaks walked into my office the other day and he asked for H million dollars for a project. Yes. But I negotiated down to H bar million dollars. So <laughs> everything was right. Yes. Have I got more t shirts? Let's. Oh, yes, that's just a caffeine molecule, yes. <laughs> Still the most successful catalyst in industry. <laughs> ah, there we go, yes. Thank you. Evidence-based, evidence-based, it's my homeopathy fan t-shirt, yes. <laughs> mm. Yes, but our approach is evidence-based. Evidence-based, evidence-based. I believe it works, so it works. I do think the European Union could have saved a lot of money by building a homeopathic Large Hadron Collider, you know. <laughs> we believe in the Higgs boson, it is there. <laughs> we will now prove it to you with a nice presentation in Comic Sans. Yes, <laughs> yes, you know, that's, uh, yeah. That's how it works, yeah. I think I have a one last t-shirt, there we go. Ah, there we go. I failed the Turing test. <laughs> yes. People who understand this joke normally fail the Turing test too. <laughs> yes, they do, yes. Good, that's all my t-shirts, so uh, that's nice, yes. So I'm very excited to be here, and I, I had a CERN tour. I could walk around CERN and see all the experiments, and it was amazing to see the history, and you know, long before in other places we accelerated electrons, and then we started accelerating protons, and now we're already up to lead ions, and slowly working our way up to ducklings, and <laughs> small mammals, and hopefully ending up one day at penguins and wallabies, and I'm really... <laughs> looking forward to this brilliant day, but there's one thing that I noticed during the tour, and it was uh, this picture that will be shown now. No, yes, it's actually there. No cleaning ladies allowed. Yes, this place shall only be cleaned by Nobel Prize winners, okay? Mm. You are simply not qualified, my lady, yes. But I understand why physicists get upset when they see people cleaning, you know. We get annoyed and we think, oh my God, they really think they can lower entropy. <sighs> I told it to my mom, I said, Mom, you're only lowering macroscopic entropy. You're not fooling anybody, you know. <laughs> yes. And we visited the office of John Ellis, you might have seen it already. It's a famous office, it's really untidy and it's full of paper and I think you should put a sign up there saying, Entropy! It's what's coming in the end, so why bother? Yes. <laughs> that would make sense, yes. Yes, cleaning ladies. You know, somebody said, it's a bit of a sexist sign. You know, Scandinavians might be upset and say, look, yeah, why, why is it a woman? Why is it a woman? Is it a and it's dangerous because people call you sexist very fast these days. The other day I was called sexist because I parked my car in one smooth movement. But, <laughs> but, mm, but I'm not sexist. I'm a modern man. I believe in emancipation. I think men should help around the house. We should help clean and do the dishes and everything. That's modern and it's equal and it's right. But there's one thing that annoys me and it's this. All the generations before me, men did nothing in the house, okay? My father never did the dishes or never cleaned or tidied anything. And my grandfather and all the generations before that, women did everything in the house. Now, all the generations after me will have robots to do the housework. Yes. Now, this means that in a few hundred thousand years of human civilization, only one generation of men will have to do the dishes, and it's bloody me. 
Okay? Yes. And one thing I want to add, had these starts left us alone a bit longer, those robots would have been finished by now, okay? Yes, good. So much for the sexist jokes, yes. Yeah, yeah robots, you know, robot, uh, robot technology is, is really advancing fast. There's one thing I think we haven't quite done properly yet, and it's artificial intelligence. And I know this because I use Windows word processors. And no, no, and you start typing and then suddenly there's something, there's some artificial intelligence saying, I noticed you have started two lines with a dash. I think you want to start all the lines with a dash. <laughs> yes. I think you want them to start at the middle of the page. Yeah. You're welcome, no need to thank me. <laughs> and then you go like, no, you fuckhead, I do not want this. And then I, I'm sorry, it is there now, I cannot fix it. <laughs> It is impossible. I do, ah, I'm sorry, I do not know. Yeah. Then you put three dashes in a row. Oh, you put three dashes in a row. You think, I think you want a line. I <laughs> give you a line. Yes, take the line away. Delete, delete. No, I move the line up a bit. It yeah, is no problem. Yes. Yes. And, then you, and you, you finally erase it, and then you start three dashes again. Oh, you want a line. No, you fucking thing. And it's even worse with Windows Media Player, you know? <laughs> Somebody mails you a movie clip and it goes like, and you want to open it and you double click it and then you have several programs for media and then Windows Media Player just comes like. <laughs> <laughs> can I do it, can I do it? <laughs> it's a clip, it's a movie, can I do it? I can do it, I can do it, can I do it, can I do it? <laughs> so you go like, all right, uh, you can do it. Oh, okay, let's see, it's, um, a uh, DivX file, it's, uh, with, with, uh, well, uh, it's a code, it's a code. Do you have the codex? No, I don't. Oh, I can't do it. <laughs> well, no, no, sir, I mean, no codex. Come on, I cannot do it. <laughs> hey, so I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot do it. You know, next time you open a clip, you go, oh, can I do it? <laughs> I can do it. Yeah. All the time, VLC player just sitting in the back. Like, is he, is he finished? <laughs> can I do it? Yeah? Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another, another thing I saw when I walked around CERN is that the official CERN car is a Fiat Cinquecento. <laughs> oh, that would be my ideal car, you know, because my wife is really, really fond of Fiat Cinquecento, and I will basically have sex with everything with a CERN logo on it. So <laughs> give me one of those cars, you know, so I don't have to steal them, yeah. I could easily steal them, the border, is, the border is just over there. You could just drive over the border, yeah. I want this Fiat. You know, what I like about Fiat is they also have, you know, you know the, the, the original sentence of Fiat comes from the Bible, and it was Fiat Lux, let there be light, in Latin. God said, Fiat Lux, let there be light, and there was light. And then suddenly they produced the Fiat Panda. Yeah. <laughs> yes, let there be Panda. <laughs> hmm? And God said, let there be Panda. And suddenly they were pendai all over. <laughs> yeah. it, that, that, that's what, that would make Greenpeace a religious organization, you know, with a panda. God said, Fiat Panda, we must not destroy Panda. We need Panda on this beautiful religious planet. Yes. Yeah, also, what I also learned during the tour is that the LHC um, is, is sometimes has, has an influence of the moon, like the tides in the sea. You know, when the moon is in the wrong position, the LHC is shifted a little bit and, you know, it's disturbed. One time a month, it doesn't work properly. <laughs> yes, the LHC is female. <laughs> it is. Yes. And of course, that would explain the complete irrational explosion we had just at the beginning when you started it up. <laughs> you know, just go, poof, unexpected, like, poof, like, what, what, what's wrong? Nobody asked me if I wanted to accelerate protons. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, come on, these magnets make me look fat. <laughs> I want them in a different color. <laughs> Female LHG, yeah. Could I have to wrap up now? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell one last engineering joke. Well, let's tell two engineering jokes. You know, you know why an engineer will never come when he masturbates? No. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, yes. I do. I do apologize if I offended people. I mean, come on. It said adult comedy on the flyer, and that means I can be childish. You know, that's uh, it's, it's, it's right. Now, my last engineering joke before I run off. Uh, okay, just imagine that you ask an, a mathematician, um, a physicist, and an engineer to calculate the inertia of momentum, or the momentum of inertia. What do you say in English? Nobody knows. <laughs> so, I can just say what I want. You want to calculate the fluffy, fluffy flow? <laughs> no. You want to calculate the inertia thing, you know, the spinning thing, yes. And you ask a mathematician and a physicist and an engineer. Now, what will the mathematician do? He will just ask for the mass of the disk. It's a metal disk, you know, it's like this, like this metal disk. And he will just ask for the, the mass of the disk, and then he will measure the radius, or he will ask an engineer to measure the radius, because <laughs> he will not touch a physical object. And then he has this beautiful formula, I think it's I equals one half m r squared or something, and he just calculates, and he knows the momentum of inertia. Now, a physicist will have a more experimental approach. Now, what he does is he takes this disk, and he puts a small axis in the middle, so it, it, it becomes a wheel, you can imagine. Like, the disk is here, you have a small axis there. Now, what you do then is you glue two pieces of rope at each side, so at each axis, here is the, here's the disk, piece of rope here, up to the ceiling, piece of rope here, up to the ceiling. And then you wind it up. You start winding, 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 one meter high, you let go, and it starts spinning down. Now, you know it was one meter high, you know the mass of the disk, so you know what energy it took up when it came down, and then you measure how fast it spins, and then you just divide, and you have the momentum of inertia. That's how a physicist does this. Now, what will an engineer do? He will take the metal disk, he will look at the site at the serial number, and look everything up on Google. <laughs> so. <coughs> Thank you very much and see you again. Oh, awesome, awesome. Wow. It's amazing and keep that round of applause going as we welcome back our last act of the evening. You've seen him once, you loved him, then you will love him for a second time. It's Johnny Bellino, everybody. Hooray! Wow. Okay, so um, so uh, uh, when I started doing these science songs, um, I, I started out as just your average um, musician, uh, songwriter, singing songs about stuff. And then a wonderful podcast uh, called The Guardian Science Weekly, which I, I uh, urge everyone to listen to every week. It's wonderful. Um, phoned me up and they said, "Will you? can you do a song about science? And I did. And then it sort of... Uh, people were quite positive about it, and I did more. And then they sort of realised, and they could phone me up. They always did their recording on a Friday, and they realised that they could phone me up on a Tuesday and say, can we have a song about this? And I'd, I'd say, yeah, why not? Because I was a musician at the time, and I didn't, I didn't do much. That meant I basically had a lot of free time. Um, and he went, one day they phoned me up, and they said, it was, it was the Tuesday, they said, um, can we have a song about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? And I, I thought, how can you do... I, firstly, I didn't understand Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Second, I didn't know how that could possibly be funny. Um, um, but I, I, I did my reading, and, um, and I wrote this little jazzy number. So I'm going to croon for you a little bit now. The quantum world can be a touch absurd Describable in numbers, but nonsense in words Where waves are really particles, and particles are blurry What can we infer from all of this? Everett said that there were infinite realities The Copenhagen explanation sounds like insanities With consciousness affecting wavy particle dualities The actualities are rather mysterious it is, a, it is a principle, there ain't no denying. So learn from Werner Heisenberg and you will be flying. If you want a formula that you can rely on. Well, I got one for you. With Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, you can be uncertain for sure. 
With Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, you know where you are. And what's more, if you know where you are, you won't know your momentum. Even if your Neil's bored and he's smart, you can certainly be certain how uncertain you are, sir, with Heisenberg's uncertainty law. When you're measuring little things, there's a limit to how accurate you're measuring. It's defined by an equation. The equation really swings. So I'll sing it and you can see the standard deviation of the position's imprecision times the standard deviation of the momentum's imprecision is greater than or equal to reduced Planck's constant over two. It works the same for time and energy. It is a principle, there ain't no denying. So learn from Werner Heisenberg and you will be flying. If you want a formula that you can rely on, then I got one for you. With Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, you can be uncertain for sure. With Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, you know where you are. What's more, if you know where you are, you won't know your momentum, even if your Neil's bore. And he's smart, but you can certainly be certain how uncertain you are, sir, with Heisenberg's uncertainty law. Yeah, Heisenberg, he was one swinging cat. He sure was glad he wasn't Schroding his cat. Smooth jazz. Now, much, much has been made this evening, uh, said uh, about the, uh, the CERN was the, the home and the founding of the, the World Wide Web, which undoubtedly has, well, I think has changed modern life probably more than anything else. Uh, uh, um, apart from maybe the washing machine, that changed modern life, apparently. Um, but the, the, but the web is a close second. Um, and of course, the web is used for all sorts of things, um, some of which are quite nefarious um, and bad. Um, but I use the net for all manner of wonderful things because um, you can watch endless geeky videos. So, so I've become slightly addicted to watching geeky videos on the internet. I watch Richard Feynman videos on a regular basis. Um, and I've, I've, I sh I'm, I'm a physics teacher during the day a lot of the time as well. So I show YouTube videos to my students as well. Um, so I absolutely love them. And of course, internet addiction is now a big thing. Um, uh, you, get, you, get treated for, you can get treated for it in China. Um, so I am addicted. I'm an internet addict, but only to geeky things. So this is, this is my ode to the internet. He was down so very low No one understood Unemployed and lonely And his life was no damn good An Apple Mac for company Is all he can find So he's sitting on the internet Looking for good times He's down low He's down, down, loading his good times 250 million websites With anything he could hope to see 500 petabytes per day across the planet digitally. A universe of data should make a stimulated mind. But he's sitting on the internet just looking for good times. Now internet addiction is an affliction of the modern day. Entangled in the web, the addict gets his kicks by clicking all his time away. Yeah, and his life just passes by. And he's sitting on the internet looking for good times. He's down low. He's down, down, loading his good times. Maybe too many good times. All the lonely people seeking company just want someone to type to, so the internet's the place to be. Hell, it changed communication. It made the fax machine deceased. And who predicted Twitter would bring revolutions to the Middle East? Three billion folks now living happily online. 
Sitting on the internet, downloading at good times, but there's good and bad that comes from every type of new technology. One quarter of all searches are searching for pornography. So click your private browser and nobody will find the history of where you've been downloading your good times. You down low, you down, downloading your good times, yeah, your dirty good times. And you can choose whatever suits your mood. But I always look for something clever, never nothing rude, yeah. I'll only watch a sex scene on a nature documentary. Only click on anal, reading up on OCD. And if I want some hardcore, I give string theory a try. Sitting on the internet, downloading my good times. A three-way or masturbate on special relativity. Hot brunettes on the open university. I like a big bang, not a gang bang video by Richard Feynman. Sitting on the internet, downloading my good times. Man, I'm down low. Loading my good times, yeah, my geeky good times. I'm down low, I'm down low, I'm down, down. Loading my good times, yeah, we're gonna have a trumpet solo. have no deviant persuasions, just your standard deviations. Normally there's more statisticians in the audience that like that joke. I like to watch DNA untwisting, but I'll never watch a fisting. I like to watch quantum gravitation, no double penetration. Yeah, and anything with Brian Cox, but no interracial cream pies. Sitting on the internet, downloading my geeky good times. I'm down low, down, downloading my good times. Yeah, my geeky good times. I'm down low, I'm down low, down, downloading my good times. I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to squeeze two more in quickly. Uh, I've sung a lot of physics tonight, a lot of physics. Um, so I thought I should probably uh, at least play you my big hit, uh, which is biology, I'm afraid. Um, but it is a song about my favourite molecule, and that is DNA, because uh, where would we be without it, really? Um, so DNA is wonderful. I love it a lot. Um, so I thought I'd do a little calypso for it. So uh, um, I do it in a slightly racist black voice. Within every little cell that's in all of us Is a tiny little thing called a nucleus But it's the stuff inside that really caused the fuss Cause it's the stuff that tells our bodies how to grow into us It's a very long and complicated molecule But for something so small it's very influential It'll make you grow big and strong and tall or if it's like mine, it makes you hairy and small. It's DNA, DNA. Three little letters with a lot to say. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Hey, that's DNA. It comes in little packets called chromosome. You get half from your daddy and half from your mum. It's a double helix ladder with a code made from paired nucleic acids and it's very long. Well, the adenine pairs with the thymine and the guanine pairs with the cytosine. And when you got enough pair, then you got a gene which will tell a cell how to make a protein. It's DNA, DNA. Three little letters with a lot to say. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Hey, that's DNA. Oh, 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 o
And every time a cell divide, it make a replication. But every now and then there is a mutation. And a mutation may cause an innovation. And that might make a situation like a baby being born with 11 toes or a blood disease or a massive nose. And don't make babies with your cousin, because you should know. It multiplies the chances that the defects show. It's DNA, DNA, three little letters with a lot to say. Deoxyribonucleic acid, hey, that's DNA, DNA, oh, DNA. It could make you crazy, it could make you gay, it could make your hair fall all away, it could make it plum brown, blue or gray, DNA, oh DNA, it could make you want to fight or want to pray, it could make you drop down dead today, oh that's DNA, oh, 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 oh. Deoxyribonucleic acid, that's a DNA. Okay, okay. We've, uh... We've maybe got time for one more. I will say this, please, please, if you want to hear more songs, please do go to my website, uh, which is very simply johnnyberliner.com um, and you can go and find more songs there and that'd be wonderful and, um, and you know follow me on Twitter whatever it is you want to do um, on that sort of thing and then you'll find out when the other gigs are um, right so uh, to finish I thought I'd finish with uh, one of uh, life and physics great mysteries that of dark matter um, you can bet if, if something's got the word dark in it it's basically physics saying we haven't got a fucking clue Uh, so, so anyway, I, I like that. I like dark matter. I like, I like that we know it's there, but I haven't, I haven't got any idea what it is. It means there's jobs for all you guys for years. <laughs> when you look up in the sky at night, you're seeing a mystery. The physicists are in a twist about the forming of the galaxies. It's a very heavy issue. It's an issue of gravity. It's a dark, dark matter. Well, there needs to be a substance we're just not detecting. But it's hard to find material that just ain't reflecting. Or maybe it's our theories, they need some correcting. It's a dark, dark matter. So why does it feel like how does it smell? If you had some in a bucket, how could you tell? Could you sit on it or sculpt it or eat it as well? It's a dark, dark matter. No, we haven't got a clue what the stuff consists of. It's not made from any particles that we has a list of. And now it's really pissing all the cosmologists off. It's a dark, dark matter. Scab of it a people! Scab If you had some in a bucket, how could you tell? Could you sit on it or sculpt it or eat it as well? It's a dark, dark matter. <laughs>